Well, I'd like to thank everyone for um, taking their lunch time and being here with us today about this uh, very important topic. Um, but there were some people that couldn't make it. They were on the list as some first responders be because of the coronavirus. They're at a briefing, but they did send in their written testimony too, so we'll have that. Um, and I'd like also like to thank Dutchess Community College for hosting us today. I'm joined here today by Senator George Borello, and Senator Gallivan is on his way up the hill, so he'll be here momentarily. Uh, Senator Borello comes to us with the background as a county executive, and Senator Gallivan comes to us with his own firsthand experience as a former state trooper and county sheriff. Uh, so we'll just go over a little quick recap of uh, what's been going on. So as you know, as part of last year's state budget, sweeping changes to our criminal justice system were passed. At the time, there were no public hearings were dedicated solely to this topic, and the voices of many of those on the front lines were left out of the conversation. Immediately after the laws were passed, I began soliciting feedback from these folks. Members of the domestic violence advocacy community were among the most vocal about how some of these changes could present dangerous challenges for them as they work to protect their victims. In November of last year, Senator Gallivan and I joined, joined many of the folks that are right here at the press conference today to shine light on some of these concerns and announce the introduction of legislation to address them. Unfortunately, the laws went into effect January 1st, despite these valid objections. Since then, we have seen countless headlines detailing the very real impact that these changes are having on communities across the state. Just last week, the NYPD announced that major crimes have increased by 22.5% in February compared to last year. In an effort to shed light on the impact these changes are having, we convened the Repeal Bail Reform Task Force to hold these public roundtables statewide so those on the front lines would have the opportunity to be heard. I think it's important also to note that we can all agree no one should be jailed simply because of an inability to pay bail. But we have a responsibility to put public safety first, and that starts by listening to those responsible for maintaining it. So with that, um, I'm just going to introduce Senator Galvin, but I'm going to, I don't know, is he out there? Oh, sorry. He's coming right in the door. Oh, okay. Sure. Oh, yeah. That's Good morning, everybody. Uh, again, I'm Senator George Borello uh, from the 57th Senate District over in uh, beautiful Western New York, uh, and um, you know this is uh, incredibly important today to hear from you folks. You know this is what did not happen, as Senator Serino said. Uh, the, the the voices of the folks on the front lines, in law enforcement, our district attorneys, those work, uh, those that work with people. Uh, uh, you know, in victims' rights groups and others. These are the voices that were ignored in, in exchange for a small group of radicals with a political agenda. So this is the second in a series of meetings that we're having, roundtable discussions, so that we can record your comments, take your suggestions, and formulate something that I believe will help us make this uh, situation better. But it needs to start, first and foremost, with repeal repealing the bail reform law, which has been so disastrous. That's why, as a conference, we have been pushing for this. Uh, and it's important for us uh, to, once that happens, then go back and have a common sense solution that includes the input and advice of those of you that are on the front lines uh, of this uh, law enforcement situation, and, uh, and really uh, the, the folks that are really doing the best job out there to help people that are, in, that are caught up in the legal system, not by passing some blanket law uh, that essentially has created this catch and release system, which as Sue had pointed out, uh, has created a massive increase and a tragic increase in crime throughout our state. Is, there's literally not a corner of the state that hasn't been impacted by this. Uh, in uh, Jamestown, New York, which is in my district, a small city of less than 30,000 people, just in the month of January, a 72% increase in those folks who no, did not show up for the court date. For a small community, with a small police force to have to deal with that it is just devastating from, from not only from a public safety standpoint but from a budgetary standpoint. So we appreciate uh, hearing from all of you as we did in Buffalo. Uh, and uh, just some, I will actually I'll pass it over to Senator Gallivan. Uh, you were already introduced uh, with your background in law enforcement. Uh, and then after that, we'll just do some quick guidelines before we head into the uh, hearing from everybody on this. Uh, thank you. Thanks, George. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I appreciate the fact that everybody's here and willing to take the time 
Uh, and I think enough has been said. Hopefully we can have some positive change out of this, but your time is valuable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a, a few guidelines. Um, uh, in, in each of these roundtable discussions, we're asking each person to take about five minutes uh, to present their position <clears throat> and, and their thoughts. Um, we're specifically looking for you to highlight your concerns with the new changes, provide feedback on any parts of the new law you may like, and provide feedback on those amendments that you'd like to see. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, following uh, the participants' participation, uh, we'll, we will have a chance to ask questions of you if you would like, and, uh, and we can hopefully get a little bit of dialogue here. Uh, and then I, we ask that those who have rebuttals to whatever someone is saying to please hold those to the end so we can then have that discussion. Uh, you will have time given at the end uh, for others to participate as well. Uh, anyone here today or anyone who could not be here today, uh, you're welcome and encouraged to submit written testimony uh, either here if you would like or you can send it to, to my office via email at borello at nysenate.gov and that's B-O-R-R-E-L-L-O, -L -L uh, two R's and two L's at nysenate.gov dot gov or uh, to Senator Serino uh, at Serino at nysenate.gov S-E-R-I-N-O. Uh, so we again we appreciate you all being here uh, and then uh, with that uh, we will actually head over to our uh, first speaker uh, uh, Sheriff Anderson. Would you like a, if you don't mind yeah there's a, there's a microphone down there if you wouldn't mind passing that down to him or do you want to Did you wash your hands? <laughs> yeah. First of all, uh, we certainly appreciate you being here. One of the main things is with New York State Sheriff's Association, we met on this. There was no input from law enforcement or judges. It was just passed. And uh, what we're looking for is discretion and common sense in uh, bail reform. Main thing here is uh, my deal is the victims that are going to be affected on this. Now, Michael uh, Riley is the administrative person in charge of all our notes that we took down this morning at, uh, at a morning meeting with the chief and the undersheriff. And at this time, he's going to read five points to you of our concern. And uh, I think they're, they're going to affect everybody. But the main thing is there was no input. We sent letters. We asked for input. And the only one that listened to us is you. And uh, we certainly appreciate it. So Michael, will you read them? Yes, I'm Michael Riley. Uh, of the concerns that the Dutch County Sheriff's Office has is more along the lines of the discovery process. Discovery process, we currently now have 10 members assigned and their sole job is to meet the requirements of the discovery law. Because our department uh, needs to turn over the information in quick form and fashion, we usually have to turn it over within 10 days to the district attorney's office so then they can meet with the 15-day requirement to turn the information over to the accused and their counsel. Uh, that causes us to have to move very quickly and get all the information together. That's 10 members that are now assigned from their original duties to their sole purpose of handling that information. Uh, there's a significant cost to the taxpayers because of this, because now there's overtime that's incurred by our department because we have officers that specialize in being able to pull the information out, now have to stay much later to go ahead and get all the information together to meet the requirements. Uh, victims and wit uh, witnesses are significantly more reluctant to come forward for fear of retaliation. Uh, the victims and witness statements, as well as their personal information, phone numbers and everything else are turned over to the accused and the counsel. And they're scared that they're going to be, uh, they're going to be retaliated against. Um, CAC, uh, the Child Advocacy Center, is significantly uh, impacted because now these children victims of sexual assault or crimes, their statements, their videos or anything else that is taken with them are turned over to the suspect that committed these crimes as well as to the council. So these children's rights feel like they're being taken away. Um, Dutchess County Sheriff's Office started their planning process because of this discovery law back in May of 2019. We started sitting down uh, frequently, weekly, with the district attorney's office to hash through this uh, and work out uh, the requirements for the discovery law 
as well as the retraining for the officers involved. Uh, some of the county agencies involved in, uh, that are affected by this include not only us, the Sheriff's Office, the DA's Office, the OCIS, the Office of uh, Communication Information Services, our Drug Task Force, our Child Advocacy Center, uh, Duchess 911, and the Medical Examiner's Office. Um, Sheriff has said time and time again uh, that he expressed his concerns that the victims are not only victims of the crime, but are also of the system originally put in place to protect them and to keep them safe. Basically, that's our, our points that we're concerned about. And um, whatever you three can do is certainly going to help us. We have any questions from the? I just have uh, one question. Maybe uh, Mark, you can maybe even address this. But one of the claims that the um, the governor has made is there's savings in your jail. I know in Chautauqua County, where I'm from, we're already at minimum staffing levels as it was. Mm -hmm. So there was no savings other than a few less meals a day. Can you uh, speak to that, or shall you know? You, you mind if I do? You want to hear the number? Oh, go ahead. If you're, we're at 200 today. So. Um, uh, th th it's, a, it's an excellent point. Um, num number one, to be clear, uh, the Dutchess County Jail had already, uh, in by work at the Sheriff's Office and working in partnership with uh, our department's probation and behavioral and community health, we had begun a fairly aggressive diversion process. So the county, over the course of the last uh, eight years, saw a, a, about a 40 percent reduction in inmate population just to begin with, uh, through electronic monitoring and other and other programs that some of the departments here that w would would certainly be able to reference. We have, by necessity, with the sheriff, probably the most comprehensive uh, ATI programs in the state. Mostly because for years, Dutchess County had more inmates than it had jail capacity. So we already had that built-in infrastructure. Uh, when bail reform uh, ultimately came into effect, we didn't see a seismic reduction in inmate population as, uh, by the way, one, we worried, and two, communities uh, were told would occur. And because of that, we didn't see an initial reduction in staffing requirements. We have seen a reduction in some overtime costs, but that's sporadic, and that isn't, that isn't reliable or consistent. Uh, so from our perspective, we are not achieving uh, uh, at least operational savings. Second, and everyone here, uh, uh, certainly from law enforcement, knows this, uh, the state of New York dictates staffing uh, requirements. Yeah. And in the case of the Dutchess County uh, Jail, uh, we have uh, a, a, sta a staff uh, inmate ratio of 1.2 or 1.3 inmates to every CO. It's the least efficient jail in the state because of the, uh, the old nature of the structure. And we are not able to see any staffing reductions until the State Department uh, Commission on Corrections authorizes that. And they're not. Uh, and in fact, what we've been advised is they're not likely to make any adjustments to county jails uh, until this uh, sort of process moves forward. And ironically, they've even argued that since there might be an opportunity to reform some of the reforms, they don't want to make some decisions yet. So we'll be staffing as if we have uh, uh, 300 inmates or 257 inmates, uh, regardless of, uh, of the current count, which is about 190 to 200 on any, on any given day. So we've not achieved savings. Um, I, I would offer you more generally, and I apologize, I, I know that Senator Borrello and Senator Serino are where um, uh, we're responding to the ever-evolving situation regarding COVID-19, so I'm going to excuse myself. Uh, but you are uh, represented, and I think the sheriff's coming with me, uh, or I'm going with him, depending on who's driving. Um, <laughs> We sit six feet apart. It makes it easier for the both of us. Um, but I, I do want you to know that uh, uh, our uh, uh, Department of Probation, and along with uh, uh, Mary Ellen Still, is uh, uh, the Department of Behavioral and Community Health, and they can talk in, in more detail about what we've done. What I want to offer to you is the county had generally, and I know the district attorneys have, have argued this case as well, we generally understood the need to address inequities and injustices in the system. There's, there's no question that those who are poor um, have different challenges within the criminal justice system. That ought to be addressed. Uh, but what the state uh, uh, has done, and not, none of you are, are responsible for, for, for enacting this, uh, is really thrown the baby out with, with the bathwater. Um, in our county, I can tell you that we have and have had an aggressive um, pretrial uh, support structure. So when individuals uh, were uh, uh, ticketed uh, and, and ultimately had to appear for an arraignment, we were able to do the mental health screening, we were able to identify services, provide uh, um, uh, addiction or perhaps uh, mental health support during the process of adjudication. That is thrown out now so that we have individuals, as you know, who ordinarily in Dutchess County would be receiving significant support throughout 
the judicial process, whether through an ATI or in the jail setting, which is not the most pro optimal, but it's where we provide services to those in the criminal justice system, that are now not receiving any of those services. And beyond the concern that we've had about the safety to the community, we share concerns regarding the welfare for the individual, the, the, the alleged offender. So that there are those who are dealing with mental health, drug addiction, who are not getting the support services they would have gotten otherwise, who are now more likely to reoffend and reoffend and reoffend, and with that create new victims, which is where I'll, I'll end. Um, and that is to say that our concern, of course, in this case, because the uh, judiciary isn't given any degree of discretion, like in the state of New Jersey, and because there aren't, the, there, there aren't resources that were made available for pretrial services, like in the state of New Jersey, uh, individuals uh, who, uh, are, are, uh, who, who are alleged victims, right, victims of alleged crimes, are now put at greater risk, and new victims are created because we're not able to monitor support individuals who ordinarily would be behind bars while they await adjudication or perhaps under more intense uh, support services. And I'll, I'll say to you that Dutchess County is the only county in the state of New York whose electronic monitoring program meets the current bail reform. That isn't to say that we should be patted on the back for that. It's to say that there are 61 other counties in the state of New York that don't meet that standard because we were never given the time or the capacity to make the transition. And that is, the, I think, the biggest defense. We weren't, we weren't thrilled with Raise the Age, but counties were given a significant period of time to implement. The state of New York approved those implementation plans and funds those implementation plans. There is no such support, time, or structure in this case. And because of it, uh, law enforcement is put at risk, new victims are being made, and community safety is jeopardized. Thank you, County Executive. We really appreciate you being here. Sheriff, also, thank Thanks you very much. Please do. On that, one of, the, one of the worst things was when we let them all go there in, I think it was January. They were in programs in our correctional facility. They were getting help. When they went out, the one guy turned to me and he says, hey, he always called me boss. Where the hell am I going? Where do I go? And I took care of him personally because I felt so bad for him. But there's so many that were re released. And now instead, uh, we understand now, I don't know if this is true yet or not, but if somebody's sentenced to prison, we'll say for a year, a year and a half, they're looking to say, hey, do county time. Do it in the county, let the county pay for it. If that comes about, you know, we do our job, but you got to look out for these, for the victims and, and where these people are going. So when they close these hospitals, you ride around Dutchess County, how many, four, five? We're closed. They all came to us. And they have no place to go. We put the programs in effect. Dutchess County cares an awful lot. We do the best we can. So. Thank you. There are no confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Dutchess County. Just so you know that. Right. Yeah. We're leaving <laughs> Thanks, Thank you, Michael. You're all safe. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and now our next speaker is uh, Sheriff Robert Langley from Putnam County. Much like Sheriff Anderson said, you know, we have to dedicate other sources, and our primary concern is always our community and the safety of our community uh, with the bail reform and discovery reform. Um, we have to dedicate an officer who has to go through every video on every car for discovery. And he has to view from beginning to end. And during the course of viewing that, he has to ascertain what other officers are at that scene and try to find their video footage from their cars if they're from another agency so we can provide all the information to the district attorney's office. Also, our booking area is videotaped. We have to go through that, collect all that. If someone comes into the lobby that's part of the case, that's also videoed. We have to collect that video data. 
and the list just goes on and on. Our records division is also impacted as they have to change their policies and procedures on forwarding the information to the district attorney's office. Um, again, this all takes away from time that we could be out there serving and protecting our community rather than being behind a desk. People that come into our jail previously had an opportunity for intervention, whether they suffer from mental health issues or substance abuse issues. We've done a lot of work in putting together a discharge planner and having help there in the jail to get them on their way to recovery that would guide them through so when they are released, they would continue their treatment in a partnership with Arms Acres, which is a rehabilitation center for those who suffer from addiction. That intervention has been lost as a result of bail reform. We are concerned about an opioid epidemic nationally in this country. And New York State, with their bail reform, has just said, we don't care that you have an addiction problem. We'll just put you right back out on the street so you can continue with your addiction problem with no intervention. To take the authority of our judges away, who could put someone that was a danger to society in on bail and hold them in jail to protect the communities is outrageous. We have one individual who traveled from New Hampshire down to Brewster, New York, because he met someone online through a gaming app. In his mind, he thinks he has a relationship with this young lady. He went to her house. That's frightening. We arrested him. He was released with an order of protection. He violated that order of protection five times. This person is a danger, and a judge has no authority to hold him in jail under bail reform. Witnesses, victims of crimes, are hesitant to come forward. We are experiencing victims of crimes who refuse to file complaints because of the discovery reform. How is this serving our communities? How is this protecting our communities if we only allow criminals to go free without being held accountable for their actions? This isn't good for anybody. We all know that. The only solution to this for bail reform and discovery reform, in my opinion, and probably the opinion of many others, is it has to be completely repealed. We all need to sit down at the table together and come up with a good solution. We're not saying that bail should stay the way it used to be. We all agree that there needs to be some reform. But this bail reform here in New York State, no other state has a bail reform like this. And those are states that have passed bail reform. Nothing like this. This was wrong. This was pushed through budgetary committee. Nobody thoroughly read it. Nobody understood the impact. Nobody even understands that, OK, if it's not a violent crime, they're issued an appearance ticket. Well, did we look at criminal procedural law, which requires every offense that's above a Class C felony have an arraignment? So we're calling judges out to arraign someone so they can release them. Now, this impacts us even more, because now discovery reform kicks in with the 15-day window. So we have to work our tails off, and the district attorney has to work twice as hard now to get that information out. It's not fair. It's not helping anybody. It's not helping the victims of crimes. Our victims have now become the criminals as a result of bail reform and discovery reform. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your input. Um, any questions? I just, want a question. I just want to ask the same question I asked the uh, uh, county executive and, and the sheriff. You know, with, with all of this, you know, the discovery especially, uh, how is this impacting your budget and your overtime, things like that? How is that uh, from a budgetary standpoint? So far, the overtime we've been keeping under control. Um, we've had to dedicate, like I said, an officer that specifically goes through all the videos, uh, which is very time consuming. Yeah. And that officer could be out there patrolling, but this is what we have to do. Our records division, they have to do more work than they normally would have to, and this affects our ability to get records out to 
the community when they FOIL the request. So it slows down other processes so we could speed up the process elsewhere. Thank you. And we're just going to skip over to um, Leah Feldman and Family Services and then on to Bronca from Gray Smith House and then come back to the DA. So Leah, thank you so much for being here and for all of your help actually back in the fall uh, when we put together some of our bills and the press conference that you did with us. And I understand you have Caitlin Rodriguez and Kelly Morris are also here from Family Services. So thank both of you for being here. Yeah, and um, Kelly's going to speak a little bit um, around systematic issues um, that we've seen. But, um, you know, I, I think we all um, have applauded the intent behind um, this bail reform, um, addressing longstanding inequities in the criminal justice system was something that definitely had to happen. Um, but I don't think the unintended consequences, particularly for victims, um, and I'll speak to victims of domestic violence, um, just were not considered. Um, you know, domestic violence is a pattern of power and control. It escalates over time. It's a very unique crime. It's not the same as a crime um, where there's a stranger that's um, committed the crime. These are um, individuals that target one person repeatedly. And um, unfortunately, all too often, we see patterns of escalation which result in, in death. And we've seen that in Dutchess County um, too many times um, in the past 10 years. Um, and the risk is not just to victims, it's to children, it's to pets, it's to responding police officers. We also know that all too well. Um, and leading research tells us that for every intimate partner homicide, there's an average of nine non-lethal assaults. So this gives the system an, an opportunity to intervene and to stop that escalation that leads to homicide. This is also the time where we step in and we help victims find safety, but we need time. <laughs> we need time to do that. Um, when victims are connected with service providers, they're more likely to find safety. They're more likely to follow through with prosecution. But they now don't have the time um, to connect with us. Um, additionally, releasing an offender um, after an arrest, as um, was described, it, it emboldens offenders to continue committing acts of violence. Um, and it really... Um, victims who experience a lack of protection by the system are not going to reach out for help again. Uh, we are in a position where we're unsure how to advise victims. Um, we work hand in hand with law enforcement, but we are in the position where we, we don't even know what to tell them. <laughs> we don't know what advice to give them in terms of if you go to the police, this is what will happen. We heard feedback um, from some of our law enforcement partners the day after um, New Year's that you know, arrests happened in the middle of the night and the judges came out and they were like, we don't even know what to do. <laughs> so like, uh, judges weren't even given the proper information. Uh, abuse is still happening though and victims are still coming forward every hour of every day and we have, you know, no way um, to assist or protect them. So, um, you know, we would just implore um, the state to look at this again and, and, and repeal it and really find a way that we can um, create change that is impactful but also uh, continues to protect individuals and I know um, Kelly's going to speak just a little bit about the systematic Hi, thank you all for being here and thank you for giving us this opportunity to provide some feedback. My name is Kelly Morris and I'm the project coordinator for the Universal Response to Domestic Violence in Dutchess County. That's our coordinated community response here. As a whole, we have seen um, damage in our information sharing and a lot of our programs that are meant to increase engagement with law enforcement, with the prosecution, we're not able to share the information like we used to because of discovery. Because now this information, these victim safety plans, things that were previously undisclosed and could be harmful to the victim in trial, we can't share because it's going to be turned over immediately. And that's a huge impact on things like our high risk team, our domestic abuse response team, where we share that information with law enforcement and the district attorney's office. Um, we're also seeing victims who are afraid to talk to people because they don't know what's confidential or not. Advocates are supposed to have that confidentiality with victims, and it's being infringed on by discovery. So we're trying to figure out in Dutchess County how we can keep these programs sustainable and how we can protect victims and give them the proper information while communicating with our criminal justice partners. Now we're going to go over to uh, Branca from the uh, Gray Smith House. Thank you, Branca. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, like Family Services, Gray Smith House, who provides um, 
victim services has also seen some of the impact. Uh, obviously, we too support some reform. Reform is needed. We understand that. Um, one of my concerns in terms of addressing uh, service providers uh, with respect to bail reform has been, well, isn't this what advocates have asked for all along, right? Don't victims not want their partners to go to jail? Um, it doesn't feel very good, right? It feels like some of our own um, you know, words from victims over decades uh, feel like they're being turned on us, um, and that's a little concerning. But there absolutely are maybe unintended consequences. Um, we had been reassured, or some of this was moving through, uh, that domestic violence providers were absolutely in the loop, uh, and yet when it came uh, time and the uh, bail reform was passed, um, there wasn't quite the dis domestic violence exemption that we were reassured would happen. And having to explain to victims that domestic violence family offenses are not violent or they're not violent enough to qualify um, is shocking. You know, it it's invalidates someone's experience. It takes a lot for a victim to get to a point where they are going to actually call the police to reach out. And then when that reach out results in perhaps the offender getting back home before the victim gets home from a hospital is a little concerning. Um, we find that the window for getting someone to safety, like Leah shared, um, is very narrow now, getting someone out of the home. You know, and how do you make that plan very quickly? How do you exit? How do you gather your belongings, get out and get to maybe a shelter um, in a f very limited time frame um, has just made our work that much more difficult. Uh, but I will share, I think we also have um, concerns on the other side, the discovery, uh, which really impacted Gray Smith House directly. We had an offender show up um, on our shelter property, which by New York State law is confidential in its location. The address isn't posted anywhere. We know that. The law protects it. The individual was there for a specific reason. Uh, we did notify authorities. Uh, police were on the scene very quickly and had to tell staff on duty, you know, we can probably, um, you know, you're looking at a pr trespassing charge. Right, which means that this individual will be issued uh, an appearance ticket, and that is all we can do for you. Um, when the staff was informed that they were the witness in this and their information would have to be or could be potentially turned over, that was startling. That was a wake-up call for our shelter staff. Um, I could tell you that that individual, the offender, made two more attempts to return uh, to our property, um, and each time we did notify the police and try to work with law enforcement, but having to work within, okay, what are the limits, you know, and there are serious limits, really um, felt disempowering. Um, so we certainly could understand how th that particular victim felt, and I could tell you this, the offender was not on our property to trespass and to repeatedly make efforts to return you know, I, I ask you whether or not there is a potential for, um, you know, risk to safety and to public safety. Thank you. Thank you, Bronca. Actually, it's going to come uh, down to our Orange County um, DA, but I just have a, qu a quick question for you because I know that there are some folks that are arguing that there are protections for domestic violent victims included in the new uh, law which would require a victim to have an order of protection. But based on what you're saying here today, it's correct to say that what's in the current law doesn't go far enough uh, to adequately, adequately protect our victims. That is correct, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Because some of the offenses that officers have usually used, right, mm -hmm. um, in domestic incidents are the, they're classified as the nonviolent offenses. Right. And therefore, don't fall under that. Uh, and, you know, once again, historically, we were reassured that there would be an exemption and it does not go far enough. Yeah, thank okay. you for letting everyone know that today. Thank you. And now we're going to go down to our Orange County DA, David Hoovler. If I could just add to that oh, question sorry. real quick. Oh, absolutely. Um, yes. In order for an order of protection to be issued, something has to have occurred first. Right. So it's too late at yes. that point. Yes. Uh, very true. Very true. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, Senators. I, I share a lot of uh, the same 
complaints and issues that have been said by the sheriffs, by um, Executive Molinaro, and by our, our, our collaborative partners that we have um, that have spoken. I want to focus just a couple minutes on solutions because I think that, that that's something that needs to be pushed and something that the District Attorneys Association as well as myself have really pushed. And I'm just going to give some real quick ones. Um, but before I do that, I want to mention everyone talks about crime going up. Here's some statistics from the Hudson Valley, the cities of Kingston, Middletown, Newburgh, and Poughkeepsie, as compiled by the state of New York, not by me, not by any district attorney's office, and not by any law enforcement agency other than those agencies and the Hudson Valley Crime Analysis Center, comparing January and February of 19 to January and February of 2020. Robbery is up 42%. Aggravated assault is up 48%. Larceny is up 24%. Motor vehicle theft, up 79%. Violent crime overall, up 36%. Property crime, up 21%. And overall index crime, the, the um, half a dozen or so, I think eight crimes, eight major felonies, up 24% in the Hudson Valley in those four cities. So we are seeing some, some drastic changes. Luckily, during that time period, we have seen a reduction in burglary, 7%, and a reduction in homicides also. Solu <coughs> solutions. Um, first and foremost, give judges discretion if someone is a flight risk or a threat to public safety and should be remanded or released on their own recognizance or released with some kind of monitoring. Let the judge decide this on a case-by-case -case basis. Allow for an appeal process. Simple fix. That's number one. On discovery. Number two, create a staggered discovery framework that would provide for high priority preliminary discovery to be provided within 15 days. Secondary discovery would be provided on a staggered schedule prior to trial. I understand that some of my colleagues and others would want the 15 days changed, but if we only had to turn over the initial or the high priority stuff within 15 days rather than all the video, rather than everything else, this solution is very tenable, very easy to work, and it's cost efficient. Allow, third, allow for substantial compliance with the discovery law. Allow prosecutors to answer ready to go to trial when they've substantially complied with discovery requirements. No cases should be dismissed on speedy trial, speedy trial grounds, nor should evidence be precluded over inadvertent, untimely <coughs> disclosures of insignificant information, such as someone sitting in a booking room or, infor or video from a lobby or a street cam that shows nothing important to the case, i.e., if it's not relevant, then it shouldn't have to be turned over. Allow defendants, and this is a big one, number four, allow defendants to plead guilty before all evidence is tested. Defendants should be allowed to plead guilty if they and their counsel decide prior to the exchange of all evidence. It works this way in every state except ours. Do not impose arbitrary time periods for which plea offers must remain open. Our state police crime labs are backed up, not able to test all the information, and participation in our drug courts and diversion courts has dropped significantly across the state. Almost all drug courts are plea-based. Because crime labs are backed up and the drug evidence is not able to be tested, immediately lawyers, unable to counsel their clients, are unwilling to take a plea and enter drug court. I can just tell you in Orange County, I cannot speak for my colleagues, typically, in a particular quarter, we average between 20 and 25 people applying to go to drug court and are received into drug court this year in the first quarter thus far. Uh, as of uh, March 4th, we have had none. The fifth, provide statewide funding to help district attorneys, police departments, 911 call centers, forensic labs, and other entities that generate discovery to comply with the new requirements. The PCMS prosecutor case management system and DEM systems, which most of your district attorney's offices are using for the transfer and exchange of information between our offices, uh, need to be funded fully through the prosecutor's training institute. And there needs to be an efficient, secure solution to upgrade these particular programs as the law evolves and we move into the future. Over time, the amount of money given to prosecutor's offices and put toward prosecution in New York has remained flat over the past few years, while funding for indigent legal services 
and other legal aid and public defender services has skyrocketed in the last few years. Finally, when it comes to protective orders, amend a law to create a presumption of protection of all victims and witnesses identifying information until a reasonable date before trial. This shifts the burden to the defense to prove, to the defense to prove why revealing sensitive identifying information so early in a case is necessary. I believe those core six things uh, would drastically alter the system, would, are not triggering any financial burdens on the counties any worse than they are now. Matter of fact, they would alleviate it. And I would say the last thing, uh, when it comes to certain A1 drug felonies, they are now excluded or a non-qualifying offense. Uh, they, they should be included as something that, that we can seek bail. As, on behalf of all the district attorneys of the state of New York, we all agreed to one form or another that changes needed to be made. However, when you tinker with one portion of the criminal justice system, whether it's courts, whether it's corrections, whether it's police, whether it's prosecution, you will always have unintended consequences. Dealing with poverty is a difficult situation in our society. And when you just look at poverty and how it affects the criminal justice system, in my county, in Orange County, 85% of all the defendants that are arraigned and charged with a crime either receive legal aid as their principal lawyer or the assigned counsel plan. There is virtually no um, private criminal defense counsel in Orange County anymore. The state has assumed almost all of the burden. And I only say that not as, a, not as something that's said neg negatively, but as a point that poverty, crime, the criminal justice system, they've all been present in one form or another. Uh, dealing with it is an entirely different circumstance. I just want to say also that um, D.A. Hoovler is the president of the D.A.'s Association, and thank you uh, also for coming up for our press conference in the fall and being so instrumental uh, with Senator Gallivan and I. So thank you, and I'll turn this over to you. Yes, yeah, so Senator Gallivan. The, the State Office of Court Administration spent several years with a, a bail reform task force that when they came out with recommendations last February, of course, they were ignored. I'm just curious, was the DA's association involved in that at all? We were, yeah, we, were, we had individuals that sat on the Justice Task Force. Um, again, like any organization in, in the DA's, you had certain DA's across the state that were for and against it. In the end, um, it, we put it forward as, as a reasonable alter alternative to what the governor was putting out. Um, and again, it, it was very reasonable it would be much better than what we have now. Um, but again, we fail to see that when we look at the criminal justice system, the criminal mm -hmm. justice system, Senator, in, in, in I know you were the sheriff, in your area of the state is not the same as it is mine. Just like mine is not the same as District Attorney Pendy or, or here in Dutchess County. Dutchess County has way more um, pretrial services than my county has. And my county is much larger and has a greater density and has a much larger volume. So this law never considers how the local situation works. And again, the jail in Orange County was built in 2002. It was built <coughs> as a crown jewel of this is where everyone is going to go to get their services. And I actually have the legislative intent when it was built with people that spoke that this is what it was built to do. It was built as a collection point for services in, in my county, a county that has 21 towns. 19 villages and three cities, we needed a central collection point. Without that central collection point, I have no idea how the services in Orange County are ever going to be delivered in a reasonable, cost-effective manner. Thank you. Just um, one question. You know, the governor's office, and we've been hearing rumblings that they're going to present as you know something in the budget process uh, to uh, reform, quote unquote, uh, the reforms. Um, you know, has the District Attorneys Association had any contact from the governor's office? Various district attorneys throughout the state always engage. Just Very, yep. Yeah. Various district attorneys throughout the state always engage with various state senators and, and various members of the assembly across the state. We all know the process in, in this state, how that works. Um, so there are some district attorneys providing input and, and feedback on what is being said to them. Have the district attorneys as a whole seen any wording or any language telling us what is coming to this point? No, we have not. What my prediction is, we will have the same situation that we had before, where in appropriation bills, 
you will have general legislation, which it shouldn't be in there. It, it, it deprives you of your ability to have public input and govern as well as the assembly, but it's just the way we do things and we will have more unintended consequences and bad outcomes without including the stakeholders at the table. Thank you very much, appreciate that. And now we're gonna go over to our DA from Putnam County, uh, Bill Robert Tendy, thank you. Thank you. Um, I agree with everything everybody said today. I especially agree with what DA Hoover said today. Um, so rather than rehash what everybody has said, I'll, I'll get a little more personal. Um, I'm very active as a district attorney in, in handling cases in my office. I handle my own caseload. I deal with my own defendants. I deal with the parents of the kids, the parents of the defendants. So I'm very, very hands-on, and I'm fortunate in that way because our county is small enough. And I'll, I want to tell you some of the things that have affected me personally and some of the things I'm really getting tired of seeing. Um, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, when I was a defense attorney, I represented a number of young people who were drug addicts. And I started getting a guilty conscience after a while because they were going out and they were dying or they were getting sick or they were committing worse crimes than they already committed. So I started telling these parents, if you're going to bail your kid out, I'm not taking the case. And they wouldn't bail their kid out. And their child, anywhere from the ages of 18 to 35, would sit in jail. Terrible heroin addicts, most of them. And over several months, when their brains finally got rewired to the point where they could think, I would already have a deal in place with the district attorney's office and alternatives to incarceration to get that person into the program that would help them out. And it always worked. Defense attorneys can't do that anymore. We all did it. They can't do it anymore. I had two parents in my office last week, Friday afternoon, crying in front of me because their addicted daughter, who under normal circumstances would be in jail, in the Putnam County Jail, which is an excellent jail and has great facilities for people like this, she has disappeared because we couldn't set bail on her. A hopeless drug addict. Talk about the coronavirus. We lost 60,000 people last year to drug overdoses. Thousands in New York State over the last few years. And every single one of these poor people who gets thrown out onto the street, as, as uh, the sheriff uh, discussed before, every single one of them gets thrown out onto the street, they are at risk of dying. They're at risk of dying. I had a case last year where a woman had met a man in Albany in a bar. Never meet a guy at a bar, ladies. Seemed like a nice enough guy. After a couple of dates, she brought him down to Putnam County to meet her sister and her parents. They decided they were going to go out for a couple of drinks at a local bar. And midway through the evening, the girl and her sister realized this guy is crazy just sleeping out of his mind. And so they said, thanks, but no thanks, we're leaving. He started cursing at them, threatening them, followed them out to the parking lot, started dropping F-bombs all over the place. They got in the car and they drove home right away. He followed them. They ran into their home. He came out of his car with a bottle of Hennessy, smashed the back window of their car, and lit it on fire and screamed, I'm gonna effing come back and eff you up, and walked down the road. That was last year. We set bail on him. We set bail on him last year. This year, we wouldn't be able to do that. That maniac, who by the way had a history of not appearing in court, and also had a history of beating women, one of them was where he kicked a pregnant woman in the stomach. The new bail law makes it impossible to set bail on a guy like this. And I think, and if you're watching, I'm sorry to be impolite, I think that's sick. And I think you have a lot of nerve screwing up our judicial system without talking to us first. You have no idea what you've done. I want to recommend a law that's very, very progressive. It's a really progressive bail reform law. You take into account the person's financial resources. You take into account the person's criminal history and the person's history of returning to court. You take into account whether or not the person has used a handgun or a, or a weapon in the past. You take into account whether or not 
he's had a history of family violence. Yeah, you take into account his personal finances. You do not take into account what he's being charged with. What he's being charged with is irrelevant. It's whether or not he's a risk to return to court or if he's a risk to hurt somebody while he's out. That's a progressive law. That happens to be the law we had before you passed this law. But nobody read that law. You took a bunch of statistics, you loaded it up, you formulated an opinion without speaking to anybody who works with human beings as opposed to numbers, and you passed this very, very dangerous law. And let me say one more thing. There were aspects of bail that needed to be addressed. And if the bail laws in certain cities were Im inappropriately affecting poor people or people of color, then people were not using the old bail reform law, the old bail law the way they should have. As a defense attorney, if bail was set on my client in the old days, I would go to the appellate division and get it reduced. If attorneys are too lazy to do that, that's a problem. And you don't solve a problem if it is inappropriately affecting people of color and poor people. You don't solve that problem which needs to be solved. You don't solve it by putting criminals into the streets, dangerous people, who are going to affect the lives of our law-abiding citizens. I'm going to tell you one more thing. We've had people since this law was passed that have died. Children, kids who just graduated college have died. And they're going to die some more. So I'm going to ask you a question. God forbid it's your child or anybody's child in this room. But if you knew it was going to be your child, and it's going to be somebody's child, if you knew it was going to be your child, wouldn't you move heaven and earth to do something about it right now and not wait to go through talking and processes and everything else? Would you be happy to see a bunch of people in the New York State legislature talking for days and weeks and months when you know a car is about to hit your daughter? Would you be happy with that? I don't think so. So let's do something immediately because this is a real, real problem in our state. It's an emergency and it needs to be dealt with immediately. Thank you. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your your uh, your, your testimony, your suggestions, and obviously the this is this is an emotional, uh, in many ways, an emotional uh, response from people. But yet it was a law that was brought forth with nothing but emotional responses. It's emotion with. based on facts, yeah, though. Exactly. Absolutely. I work with these people. Yeah, absolutely. And then that's why it's important, like you said, repeal first, then figure out a way to do this properly. So we appreciate that. Thank you. And I just want to say to our DA attendee, you know, you guys, with the sheriff, you have an awesome drug court uh, down in Putnam County, and they've done an amazing job, and, and people need the help. And that, you like you said, oh, you they're, not sign they're not even signing up because of this. Wow. Right? Because they're not going into, uh, yeah, it's just an appearance ticket. Oh, my gosh. I feel so bad for all of those people that are actually not getting help right now, because we hear all those stories all the time, as you can imagine. Um, now we're going to go on to our ADA, Matt Weishaupt, who's with uh, our DA, Bill Grady's office here in Dutchess County. Good afternoon. First of all, I, I want to echo what both of my uh, district attorney colleagues have said, that is District Attorney Tendy and Hoovler. Uh, district Attorney Tendy's response here puts in a nutshell the emergency nature of this problem that we face. To also talk about something that District Attorney Hoovler said, he put it very well. Every county in this state is not the same. We're not set up the same. We have different programs available in different counties. In this county, We've had for years, for about 25 years, because of the nature of our jail and its overcrowding problem that has gone on for a long time, a very robust ATI program in conjunction with our Department of Mental Health and our probation department. We have had programs in place where people who went into jail were screened the very next day and were removed from the jail if they were not a risk not to return and there were programs available. They can no longer take part 
or have those programs there for them, there is no leverage to get them in anymore. So people who would be in jail, and there would be leverage getting them out for a court to set a condition that they continue in a treatment program as part of their release, doesn't exist anymore because it is non-cash bail. It runs hand in hand with what both District Attorney Hoover and Tendy said about the drug diversion courts. Nobody is going in anymore. Here in Dutchess County, we have always had a requirement before they go into a felony drug diversion court, the more serious drug crimes, that they had to plead guilty before they go in. Today, we can't get there because of the nature of the discovery laws. They must have everything turned over before a plea can be entered. So our drug court participation is down dramatically at the felony level. Those who are now being released on appearance tickets are being released with no oversight of any type at all, and the only option for a program is if they voluntarily decide to attend one. So these are direct consequences of this law. Next, what I want to say, because Senator uh, Borello, I believe, asked this question at the beginning, so I want to tell you what we've seen here as it relates to structure of the office. This more directly relates to the discovery piece that we are all struggling to comply with. We had to reshift the resources in our office to set up a discovery ECAB unit, which is an early case assessment unit, to decide what cases we were going to push out of the system, knowing we were not going to be able to handle all the cases and give full fledged discovery on every one of them to be able to move them forward. So we had to take four assistants, take all their duties away from them, push those case responsibilities onto other assistants who already had case responsibilities to focus on this discovery that is coming through the DEM system uh, that DA Hoover spoke about that we all have access to through the New York State Prosecutors Training Institute. As a result of that, as it relates to cost, this as is going to directly impact the county budget and cost because right now we have a request before our legislature, which will be voted on tonight, seeking three additional ADAs, two assist additional program assistants, an additional full-time investigator, and an additional secretary to that for that unit to be able to comply with discovery in a broader fashion. Because right now, we've diverted out of our system 319 cases that have been pushed out of the system to be handled as something other than a criminal disposition. That is either as a violation, an ACD, a dismissal in the interest of justice, or some combination of one of those things. So this will bring a cost to the county of about an additional $650,000 to allow us to be able to comply with the system because when the uh, state government put this into effect, they of course, as the other DAs have said, DA Hoover in particular, allotted no funding for it. So they put it into effect and said, go ahead and figure out how it's gonna work. So this is gonna have a direct financial impact on, on the county of Dutchess as it relates to giving the district attorney's office the additional staff it needs to re meet these requirements. I would agree across the board, as everybody said at the beginning, and my two colleagues have said, and the, the uh, sheriff has said as well, that repeal was something that should have happened. This is not repeal. This is a dismantling of the system we once know, knew and just discarding it and throwing it out. This is not a reform of any type. It is a complete dismantling of the system that puts law enforcement, the district attorneys, and perhaps most importantly of all, crime victims at a very distinct disadvantage in the system we're in now. 
So there needs to be something done, and I am very thankful to each of you for being here to hear the input from the people on the ground that are dealing with this every day as to how it is impacting them to try to get some type of effective change put in place. And I would suggest the solutions, some of them put forward by uh, D.A. Hoovler, would be very effective in taking uh, that initial step. And I also agree very strongly with the attendee that this is an emergency situation that needs to be acted on. Every day there is going to be another crime victim. Every day there are going to be witnesses put at risk by what needs to be turned over. Nowhere is this more important than in the domestic violence area. So we really need to get something done to attempt to, if we're going to have a reform, make it a reform that's done in a balanced way with the stakeholders from both sides of the equation at the table. When you don't use balance, you break a system. You don't help reform it. Thank you. And I just have a question, too. Are you actually seeing people appear, show up? Or is it too soon to ask that question? Right now, it's too soon to ask the question because with all the work we're doing, probation may have a better answer on this, but from our office standpoint, we have not been able to adequately assemble those numbers because of all the time that's being spent on discovery and trying to get the material turned over. Probation may have somewhat of an answer. I've heard various things. One of them is people aren't appearing. I've heard others that say the appearances haven't been that bad. I can't give you an accurate or informed answer as to that based on statistics we have right now. Thank you. In my jurisdiction, I know this particularly because I handle my own caseload, bench warrants are way up. People are not appearing in court. For, and this is, this is the real concern. They're not appearing in court on a lot of minor crimes. And anybody in this business knows, if you don't address the minor crimes, the street level stuff, the little, if you don't address those, it's going to bubble over into much, much bigger crime. And that's what's going to happen. And I think one of the lesser talked about issues is that 48 hour waiting period too. You know, when somebody gets an appearance ticket, um, it doesn't show up, I'm sorry, there's another 48 hours before you can serve them. So that's gonna have an impact as well. And thank you, and I'm just, now we're gonna pass the mic on to uh, Mary Allen still with, uh, she's the director of Dutchess County Office of Probation and Community Services. So thank you for being here. Thank you, and uh, thank you for organizing this roundtable today. Um, as several or most people have mentioned, um, certainly I think there is a general consensus that some reform um, was important and necessary. Um, however, I've, I've noticed that often the um, conversation would be whether we should have bail, no bail, what type of bail. And I think it's important, and I know several of, of our Dutchess County people today have mentioned um, the importance of a strong pretrial services as an alternative for um, uh, release, but release after an assessment has been done where the judge has had an opportunity to review the information uh, provided by pretrial services, so an informed decision can be made um, after looking you know, at the history of the individual. And um, in our county, we've always had a very, very strong collaboration. Um, that has been the atmosphere. Uh, we have um, worked to look at people who are very low risk and uh, probably would return to court to get them out of jail as quickly as possible. And I think under the bail reform, um, that is, is happening um, for those people. However, there are many others um, that uh, present a, um, a real risk not to return to court. Um, the focus has been on offenses rather than looking at risk level, uh, rather than looking at what people need um, in order to assist them to return to court. Um, if someone has a drug issue, 
and it's not addressed, I think the likelihood that they would not return to court increases. Uh, we have looked at every single person who was admitted um, to the jail for many, many years, going back to 1978 or 73, I think. Um, and we've devised those plans, but we have done it not in a vacuum. Um, in discussing it with a district attorney, in discussing it with defense attorneys, and coming up with a plan, um, which was then approved by the judge. Um, in almost every instance, the judge would approve the plan because it had the support of all the parties. Um, we have had real compliance um, in terms of people keeping their court dates and also following through with evaluations, um, treatment. And so they've been well along as the criminal justice process continued in terms of their treatment. And we had a good idea whether or not they were going um, to follow through. Um, one of our, our major concerns, and several people have mentioned this, is the uh, focus on the offense itself. Um, for instance, you could have a criminal mischief, but it's a criminal mischief related to a domestic violence offense. Uh, someone is trying to intimidate, they may um, uh, harm some a pet, or they may do something, damage a car, but the message becomes clear to the, to the victim, yet bail cannot be set in, in those instances. So we are seeing the impact of, of those types of cases. Uh, certainly, we have prepared um, for bail reform as much as we could. And again, that was a collaborative effort. But we are seeing, um, because the emphasis is on offense, um, not looking at the individual, not looking at the risk level that they pose, uh, people are given appearance tickets. We never see them, so we never have an opportunity to take a look at risk and needs and develop um, a program or a plan for them. Um, we have looked uh, together with our other partners and our um, behavioral health at trying to do pre-diversion, but it is extremely challenging um, to get people to agree when they're is really no incentive um, for them to do so. Uh, so weeks and months can go by um, before any services are, are actually looked at or, or considered. And I think, um, one, and again, several other people had mentioned it, but I think having discretion, uh, more discretion for the judges to look at the individual beyond just the offense would be very helpful. Um, and also taking a look at the role um, pretrial services can play in a coordinated system, not uh, working in, in isolation. So I think as we move forward, having um, that discretion, having uh, validated uh, risk assessments, and also having interventions that are gonna meet the needs of the people that we are interviewing and that have committed alleged offenses. Um, certainly, we see a lot of um, opioid, the impact of opioid use, um, concerns, domestic violence, um, sex offenses. There's an array of offenses that not all of them can have bail set on. In Dutchess County, I don't know what the responsibility is of probation. In Putnam County, our probation department is responsible to pay for all electronic monitoring. Is that a fiscal impact on your department as well? Uh, we already had an electronic monitoring program. We've had it for many years, since the early 1990s. So it has not really had an impact because we have 
had a program in existence. We worked 24 seven and the county was already um, providing the money to do that. A, a lot of that originally arose because of, we had a jail overcrowding issue. So we developed electronic monitoring for that. But beyond that, we found electronic monitoring was very helpful in um, structuring uh, people, helping them to make sure that they got to services, but also uh, for community safety purposes as well. Thank you. And uh, today we were actually going to have a representative from the Lexington Center, but because of the coronavirus emergency meeting, she wasn't able to come, but she actually had some great testimony, which we will have and we will include, with the direct impact on the opi opioid epidemic that so many of you have spoken about. Uh, so now we are going to go to Chief Anthony Garachi from the Waterville Police Department, and thank you for traveling here. Yeah, absolutely. So good afternoon. I'm, I'm Anthony Garachi from the City of Waterville. Uh, but I'm here representing the New York State Association of Chiefs of Police. So on behalf of our president, uh, Pat Fallon, Chief Fallon from the town of Greece in western New York, and all of our members across the state, we truly do thank uh, Senators Serino, Borello, and Gallivan for allowing us this opportunity to speak on such an important issue. Uh, it's unfortunate that many of our colleagues across the state in the criminal justice system, and, and I think everyone at this table and room can agree, that we're being labeled as uh, fear-mongering and instilling fear into our communities. That's not what we're looking to do. Uh, we truly do want to protect the communities we serve. And uh, when you look at this legislation, it's easy to see the demands and strict timelines placed on the district attorney's office and law enforcement, but it's very hard to, to locate where the victims are in this legislation. That's our main and primary concern. You know, it's difficult to comprehend, defend why New York by statute would not allow judges um, the ability to evaluate the dangerousness of, of the defendant. So that's, you know, when you talk about uh, which amendments you'd like, you know, to hear from our organization, that's, that's one of four clear ones, and I'll, and I'll uh, follow up at the end. I do have a, somewhat of a prepared statement I'll use as a framework, but this is, I did want to get this on the record. Uh, we do, as an association, agree with the recent testimony offered by legal counsel of the New York City Police Department um, in their testimony to the New York State Finance Committee. And they were quoted as saying, we believe that it is unfair and unjust for two individuals who commit the same crime to be treated differently as a consequence of their respective net worth. A rich, violent offender should not be released on cash bail while their poor counterpart is held in jail because he or she does not have the money to get out. However, just as important, judges should have the ability to treat both individuals equally by having the option and that's what we're looking for, to remand them into custody without bail based on the danger they pose to the community. Likewise, individuals posing no threat to public safety who commit low-level offenses should not be in jail because they cannot afford bail." End quote. Uh, this is a common sense approach that is justifiable in the essence of our association's position on bail reform. Uh, we've been involved in many cases and we've heard them today, and not to belabor the issue, but I think some of these are important. I, I'm really happy to see that domestic violence advocates are at the table. Uh, so I'm going I'm to highlight one domestic case and then one just reoffending case. So my department um, is no exception to this. Our officers arrested the same individual twice within three hours, eight days after he had committed a robbery while being on probation for committing a robbery. Uh, in the domestic case, we arrested a defendant for a domestic burglary charge. No injuries, so I'm, I'm sure you can guess where the story is going. Um, while the defendant was in custody, he was in the hospital, uh, claimed of chest pain. So while he was in the hospital, awaiting arraignment, bedside arraignment by the judge, he made multiple statements to the officers guarding him that he knew he would be released because of the New York State bail reform, and that he would be seeking revenge against the victim as soon as he was released. He also stated, and I quote, New York State is the best because of bail reform, as he continued to taunt our officers. Uh, you know, and there's countless similar situations across the state that we could discuss. We recently uh, conducted a survey. So over 200 agencies in the state of New York, law enforcement agencies, uh, municipal police agencies, sheriff's offices took part in it as well. But over 200 law enforcement agencies throughout the state uh, were asked several questions. I just want to highlight a couple. 70% of them reported that they have to reallocate human resources. So when you ask about overtime, overtime, some agencies I know for a fact are actually calculating on a weekly basis the overtime incurred for uh, discovery issues. 
but there's such a there's a larger conversation, a larger category, and some of it was brought up today with with bench warrants, right? So if someone's released in the past, uh, say a certain felony case where there's going to be a prelim set up, the officers would have to come to that court appearance. Well, if the, the defendant's not there, the officer still gets compensated and would have to come back at a future date. So there's little nuances like that, the unintended consequences that we talk about. Also, bench warrants, our officers have to go uh, potentially to you know, out of state or other jurisdictions to get a defendant and bring them back to court. And I know that's in dealing with the Albany County Sheriff, and I know the, the question came up early on about the ratio of um, CO corrections officers with, with inmates. They have not seen a reduction in staff. They've just reallocated to transportation units to go get defendants who are not uh, reporting to jail. So that's just one, one point I wanted to make. Uh, the other, the other item that's extremely important, and this is unintended consequence, uh, unintended consequence, with those 200 agencies, over 50% reported that they were either delaying or turning off body-worn camera, dash cams, booking footage, or uh, station house surveillance, just to eliminate and mitigate the amount of data that, uh, that has to be stored and transmitted. And I know for a fact, and we did ask a, a financial question in this survey, and it's in the millions of dollars, and this, you know, we're only a couple months in, but agencies had to go out and purchase um, software, hardware, reallocate resources. Um, I personally, in my agency, had to reallocate a sergeant to an administrative position strictly to deal with this issue. So that would limit uh, or mitigate overtime, but when you consider salary and fringe, it's you know, clearly over $100,000 uh, that this sergeant is, is occupying his time. Uh, once again, I just want to thank you for inviting us to discuss this issue, and uh, we're grateful on behalf of the association to be at the table. So I guess just to sum up, there, there's four things that we would like to see. Uh, judge's discretion, protection of the witnesses. This is, we held a community forum in our community, and this was one of the major concerns, the major concern, of those in attendance at the forum and then on social media as well, you know, the continuing conversation. Uh, people are overly concerned with their information being given to a defendant. We live in a very dense, and I, this is no different than many jurisdictions, very densely populated city. So there are cases where, specifically in domestic violence or animal cr cruelty cases, where we don't need that caller to successfully prosecute, you know, but a, a call to alert us of a situation is, is enough to intervene into a domestic situation. And there's no real need, uh, as far as prosecution is concerned, to give that information to a, to a defense attorney or defendant. So that's, that's one thing we really want to protect those who are, are picking up the phone and dialing 911 to alert us to these things. Definitely an increase in the time allotted for discovery. I know we say 15 days, and that's the law. But in Albany County, and we have a very good relationship with the district attorney, and they brought us in you know, very early on uh, prior to this legislation was enacted. But it's seven days for us. So the timeline for us in Albany County is seven days to turn around for discovery. And, and that's still not enough time for them to vet all of the, the body-worn camera footage. And you know, it's said that it takes 40 to 50 hours for one drunk driving arrest. And these cases are in the, in the thousands. And then the, the last one would be, obviously, this is the largest unfunded mandate in the state's history. Um, we can all point, every one of the agencies at the table can point to you know, human resources, technical resources, administrative resources that we need, that we have gone out and purchased uh, without without any funding, without any, any assistance from the state of New York. So those are, those are the four that we would like to see uh, change. And once again, thank you so much for allowing us to a seat at the table. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Chief. And now we're gonna go to Brian Levy, from the Chief Humane Law Enforcement Officer. Hi, I appreciate you inviting me uh, to this event here to speak about the concerns that we have, especially in uh, humane law enforcement. Um, basically, I'm the only investigator in Dutchess County for humane law enforcement due to uh, budget constraints and, uh, and such. Um, and this has affected us in many ways, such as um, me able to do my job in the multiple amount of volume of calls that we have coming in because of the 15-day discovery, which uh, causes me to have to concentrate more on whatever situation or case that I'm working on where I have to actually focus on making sure I get that documentation and work with the ADA's office to make sure they get the appropriate information to them in a timely manner so the case can actually be prosecuted. Um, 
which has caused me to have to put calls on the back burner for a little bit and then catch up. Uh, this also has caused a lot of concerns uh, and issues where with appearance tickets, uh, we already had, I've already had at least a case or two with this bail reform um, that people have not shown up to court. Uh, then their bench warrants are issued or arrest warrants are issued, which then makes it even harder now because then I have to revisit that and get notified and then have to find the individual to actually arrest them and bring them back in, which I successfully have done, but it takes more time and effort um, and diverts me to doing the calls going back to that. Um, the biggest concern, like I said, is most of discovery is what the biggest issue we have in this department due to the fact of we work out of agriculture and markets law. We don't work in the penal law or anything of that such. So most of our charges are misdemeanor charges. Um, they're, they're, not, they're not categorized in like penal law. There's not a first, second, third. It's all just fits under one section. Um, and it just causes a lot of issues that we have in a lot of time and uh, man constraint for obviously doing what we have to do. So that's my biggest concern. Biggest concern. Oh, thank you very much, um, Brian. And now we're going to go on to Walt Joseph, the executive director of the Children's Home of Poughkeepsie. And then we have, I think, four more speakers after that. So thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. I am uh, considerably more alarmed about this after hearing the law enforcement people talking about this. Um, I'm very worried about the welfare of children. That's what we do. We treat kids in our emergency shelter. Uh, domestic violence and foster care are tied very closely together as is substance abuse. In our emergency program, almost 90% of the children we saw in the last year come because of substance abuse and the fact that in my list of things that I wish to speak of, the inability to put people into some kind of treatment that this bail law has uh, created, I think, is very, very damaging. Um, I think anything that limits the discretion of judges in looking at these cases uh, is a mistake, and that needs to be fixed. Uh, there are a number of other things going on in the state that are sort of in the same direction. It's not bail reform, but PIN's law has been changed to limit judges' ability to place. Um, predispositional placements are now being made in my agency for kids who are exhibiting all kinds of dangerous behaviors and self-injurious behaviors, particularly substance abuse. Judges can't put those kids in care for more than a few days. There is a bill, a pending bill, and I don't know what state it's in, in the Senate, Bill 7553, called the, which we're calling in child welfare the CPS Miranda Law, that says when a CPS investigator knocks on a door because a call has been made, that investigator has to say to the parent, uh, you do not have to let me in without a court order. You, you do not have to let me speak to you. you can, this is, uh, there is, as far as I know, one person. I don't believe there's co-sponsors, and I don't know if there's a, a companion bill in the assembly, but um, it's all sort of in the same direction of limiting the discretion of enforcement investigators to act to keep people safe, and that's really what it's about. You know, we all agree that you should not stay in jail because you can't afford to make an unreasonable bail. Uh, you know, children who are separated from their parents are damaged at the moment of that separation it should be kept as short as possible if it has to happen. You know, it's one of the adverse childhood experiences in, as an incarcerated parent. It has long-term effects. So from the, from the perspective of reform bail law so that you don't, in it, you don't keep people away from their children longer than you need to, um, I don't think you just let them go right back in to reoffend against their own children. So uh, the judge ought to be the person to make that judgment, you know, based on the issues that are available to the judge. And so wherever we limit the discretion of judges, I think at the legislative level and take away the local ability to make these uh, calls, I think it's a, a terrible mistake. Thank you very much, Walt. Did you guys have any questions? No? Okay, now we're going to go on to William Eckert, Director of Behavioral Health Clinical Services at Dutchess County. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Senator Serino, for this opportunity. Uh, prior to being in my current position, I worked with the county's uh, mental hygiene jail-based services for about 15 years, so I have a pretty good idea of the uh, various subgroups that are admitted and released from the jail regularly. So let me uh, back up 
and say that right up until the first of the year, I was led to believe, as I think some of you were, that there was kind of a carve out for any of these domestic violence situations. It doesn't look like that's been carried through. This sounds horrible. Uh, and, you know, there's all kinds of unintended consequences with offenses that don't look like they're connected to domestic violence but, or children, but very well could be. That has to be rethought. And I, I didn't quite realize the magnitude of it until I was sitting here today, and it's, it's breathtaking. Uh, on the other hand, there's been another problem that's been alluded to, and I think Sheriff Anderson mentioned that. Uh, and I think we should address that. And this is before we got to bail reform. County jails were never designed to be and never should have been the homeless shelter. The county jails were never designed to be and never should have been the acute psychiatric centers. They were never designed to be the medical opioid and alcohol detox centers. And they never should have been the primary medical providers for a substantial, mostly transient population that comes in and out of our jails. How did we get to this point? And I think Sheriff Anderson earlier in the day alluded to the process of deinstitutionalization that happened several decades back right here in Dutchess County. We had Hudson River uh, Psychiatric Center. At one point, there were 8,000 people there. It was its own city. In, in Eastern Dutchess, there was Harlem Valley's psychiatric centers, there's Wasake Developmental Center. These were huge institutions. Now, I, I believe that there were uh, misuses of that institution. I don't think people should have been there and should have stayed there for the rest of their lives. On the other hand, uh, I think it's not hard to conclude that some of the folks that we're seeing now coming into the criminal justice system have been there now for quite some time, would have been somehow absorbed in this larger system, okay? So I, I'm just putting it out there, and I think it's fairly well documented that as the, uh, uh, the inpatient psychiatric centers were dismantled and that uh, those people were deinstitutionalized, that portion of folks in the criminal justice system seemed to increase. So and I think that's reasonably well documented. Uh, but let's look at a couple of other things. Uh, Mary Ellen still other have mentioned that we do have a robust ATI program in Dutchess County and pretrial programming. So let's look at some other things specific to Dutchess County I just want to mention. And this happened prior to bail reform, but in our current environment, until some changes are made, they, we could have been, uh, uh, let's say, perspicacious. That may not be the right term. Forward-looking, okay, uh, County uh, Executive Molinero's part. In 2017, we opened uh, just a couple blocks from here the Dutchess County Stabilization Center, which is a 24-hour program. Uh, it's, uh, we will take anybody with any kind of a mental health concern. It could be substance abuse, could be developmental disabilities, all ages. We've had people as young as four, and I think the oldest has been 92. So, you know, this will take any age, will take any ability group. Uh, for, and uh, within Dutchess County, I know uh, approximately 75% of the law enforcement officers have received CIT, that's crisis intervention training. This is an intensive 40 hour course and uh, the officers who have been through it, the, the, the ones that I've spoken to have nothing but high regard for that programming. Uh, what we saw in the run up to January, and it could be related, is there was an increase in the number and rate of law enforcement assisted transports to our stabilization center. These are voluntary transports. Now some of the jurisdictions will do that. Uh, so this speaks well of law enforcement doing an initial assessment in the field and the public becoming more comfortable with just, oh, it's the police, but they'll take them to the stabilization center. And that seems to have worked out very well. That being said, not for some of the individuals that were discussed here today, but for a low level offender with significant mental health or possibly substance abuse uh, issues, maybe they didn't need to be in jail. Now, now, let's look at the positives, okay? I know for a fact that Dutchess County Jail, I worked there for years, the staff there puts out a Herculean effort to provide a safe and humane environment. That being said, a jail is a jail. It is a criminogenic environment. The longer you keep a low risk individual in that environment, actually the worst result you get, you actually increase recidivism. This is very different from the high risk individuals who you're talking about who are a positive threat to the community. 
So some things that are happening possibly with bail reform is that some of those individuals never quite made Dutch touchdown in the jail. And I can tell you from experience having worked with that population, once they're in the jail, it's not that easy to get them out, although you do have the luxury of doing the assessments. You can get a care plan together, and that sometimes works very well. That being said, not all the individuals that did wind up in the jail who were of a low-risk nature needed to be there. So some of these individuals are not being brought into that environment, and that could be a positive thing, all right? Uh, but as has been uh, mentioned many times, it seems like risk level has not been taken into account. It's been overly connected to offense and not the, you know, the person sometimes there's substantial history and the court in, uh, has access to it, but they seem to be unable to take it into uh, consideration at this point as to whether bail is granted. It seems to be very rigid. Um, so uh, what I would say is that there have been some positives uh, in general in the last several years in Dutchess County. Uh, there have been some very positive interactions with the mental health system and law enforcement. We've noticed uh, on mental health side an uptick in some of the acute services. I mentioned the stabilization center. We have a mobile crisis team uh, that also operates 24 hours. Uh, we have ride-alongs. I think we have three shifts now. I think we have one in the uh, 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 village of Rhinebeck and in, in the city of Poughkeepsie where a caseworker just rides along in, you know, in one of the shifts with the police. And that's worked out very well, just offering services to people they see. All those people that were admitted to the jail and going through detox or in an acute psychiatric state, they are someplace, okay? And I think Dutchess County may be a little bit ahead of the game in that we have the resources put in place several years back. And it wasn't in anticipation of bail reform, which kind of hit us over the head. But it's just that we happen to have some of these services in place, so we may be in a somewhat better situation than some of the communities. So I, I just want to say we are also fortunate that we have a very active and robust criminal justice council where mental health, the DA, the public defender, the probation, um, and the various substance abuse providers, we can sit down and we can hash things out as we go along. We have an active bail reform system response uh, committee, and we're kind of taking things a, a, a step at a time in trying to intervene uh, in this new environment. So I, that's my statement. I'm not sure if that's helpful, but that's just my view of the situation. Okay, now we are going, and thank you, William. Now we're going to go over to Mayor James Michio from the village of Fishkill. He's here on behalf of the New York Conference of Mayors. So thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, for having me and uh, Senators. Um, I am uh, representing uh, New York Conference of Mayors as a recent past president. I'm here representing Mayor Bob Kennedy of Village of Freeport. I think you're going to be down that way uh, at your next one. I, I hope you get to to see uh, Mayor uh, Kennedy. He's uh, he's got a lot of uh, theories on on how to fix this. Um, he'll tell you how he had to raise his budget seven uh, seven percent this this year for the first time in since the tax cap because of uh, dealing with the disco discovery. Um, somebody mentioned earlier about uh, the, the governor said counties would see savings with the lower jail costs. That's great if the counties do see that, but the local municipalities don't see any savings that go to the county. We, we only see increased um, costs. And I can speak just for uh, my village. We're a very small village down in Southern Dutchess. Uh, we have a part-time police department uh, we only have a certain number of officers that we can uh, hire. We're limited to the number of officers and we're limited to the number of hours each officer can, can work. Um, so reallocating uh, an officer is really difficult. We'd have to have multiple officers and that would lead to, um, you know, people having to try to coordinate what they've done so far. So. Um, in our situation, um, we're on a proce budget process now. We're going to be hiring uh, two part-time um, clerks to work with the police department. Um, I was just informed on the way up here that our court has asked to increase our part-time court clerk to a full-time position to handle the additional um, duties of the court clerk. Um, this also covers discovery is vague, but everybody that we've talked to believes it discovers building and, and zoning code violations. Um, 
which means that we're going to have to increase our zoning officer, uh, planning zoning secretary's hours to handle any of those kind of discoveries. Um, with the 2% tax cap, which this year for a, a June budget is 1.78%. With these unfunded mandates, we're not going to be able to stay under the tax cap. Um, so, you know, as with a lot of things that happen in, in Albany and uh, on your side, um, but the cost of, of all their wonderful ideas are put down and, and the burden is on the local taxpayers. Um, so we have, uh, NICOM has put together, we have five suggestions for, um, for changes. Um, one of the changes has to do with, we have a lot of um, the smaller villages that their courts only meet monthly, which the 20 day um, time frame for, uh, um, <laughs> for returning a, the, the 20 day is, is, they have to now meet twice or three times a month to, to do that, which then increases their costs. So our um, recommendations um, ensure that the cities and villages that are provided with additional financial uh, and operational support to offset the costs of these um, mandated issues, allow 60 days for prosecutors to, to disclose evidence to the defense for criminal charges unless the defendant remains in uh, incarcerated. Um, I think a lot of the the thought process with this um, quick turnover with discovery was to get people out of jail. But if you already let them out of the jail, why are we rushing to give them the, the information? They're out. They're free. Um, so it's kind of you already fixed that problem and now you fixed it again. Um, exclude from accelerated discovery requirements um, any change, uh, any charge not involved uh, not involving a misdemeanor or a felony and clarify that the requirements do not apply to traffic parking and code enforcement violations. Adjust the 20 day arraignment requirement to accommodate local courts that meet on a monthly basis and allow prosecutors to withhold sensitive information such as victims con contact information without having to obtain a court order. So those are the five uh, recommendations that NICOM uh, has put forward. Um, we will be in Albany um, on March 23rd for a, a lobby day and a press conference on other issues, but this will probably be the, the biggest one on our, our agenda. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jim. And now we're gonna go to Kimberly Kokum. She's the Executive Director for the Center for Prevention of Child Abuse. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the Senators for convening this discussion and thank you also to my uh, fellow panelists and speakers, um, I think that there's so much on bail reform that needs to be unpacked. I think that this is a really thoughtful way of collecting information from the front lines, and I applaud your efforts. Uh, for those of you who don't know, our child uh, Center for the for Prevention of Child Abuse also houses the Dutchess County Child Advocacy Center. Um, and so in the Child Advocacy Center, we serve children that have undergone severe physical abuse and child sexual assault in Dutchess County. Uh, last year, we served 416 children that qualified under those parameters. Um, so since uh, so many of our response partners have already spoken, and I thank you for that, um, we do work behind the scenes with many people in this room, family services, for example, the district attorney's office, law enforcement, um, and so rather than to reiterate everything that they've already said, I'd like to focus my, uh, my time on the child victims. Um, I think that, it, to echo what many people have said, um, reforms to consider would be uh, specifically the definition of violent offenses, um, increasing the discretion of judges, and to be more thoughtful on the long-term ramifications of the, uh, of the laws that are listed. Um, having done my research, you can see here, um, I, was, I was truly appalled at some of the reforms that have gone into effect. Um, the work that we do at the center is, is very, very close to my heart, and watching these children walk in through our doors when they have nowhere else to go, um, it, it will truly touch your heart. Um, we know from research that nine out of 10 children are abused by people that are in their immediate family or family friends. 
Um, so if you know an offense occurs and an offender is released, uh, after a child's made a disclosure, and some people have touched on the dis discovery laws, the child is sent home, and then so is the offender. Um, so the potential ramifications on that, I don't think I need to, uh, to go into detail. Um, I've also noticed that through my time at the CAC and working with these partner organizations, I haven't come across a child um, or an offender that, it cho that chooses only one child to abuse. Um, so not only is the victim who's made the disclosure at risk for reoffense, um, but you're opening up Pandora's box and releasing that offender back into the community to either offend other children in the home, um, other kids online. Um, I notice that some of the laws that uh, you can't be held on bail for include uh, child pornography, sex trafficking, um, things of that nature. Um, so I think that while these might seem like minute um, nuances, um, it's really important to take a very close look at and not just categorically saying any nonviolent offense, uh, you know, it, they're due uh, release. Um, I will say of, of, of note, I am grateful that bail reform has not gone further than it has already. Um, however, it's terrifying to think that that could happen. Um, you know, the work that we do here doesn't operate in a silo, and it's disheartening to see that we are now uh, s burdened uh, with the decisions that have been made independent of um, the expertise that the people in this room bring to the table. Um, I've also learned from, uh, from my dear friend, Senator Serino, that oftentimes the devil is in the details. Um, so I would like to highlight one particular law um, that bail will not be issued for, um, reckless assault of a child. Reckless endangerment, uh, endangering the welfare of a child is, is also there. I think most people are probably more familiar with that, uh, that language. And as I mentioned, the offenses of child pornography and sex trafficking. Um, but reckless assault of a child uh, really boils down to um, shaken baby syndrome, um, throwing a child against a wall under the age of five, um, hitting them in the head, that, that causing um, injury to the, to the brain. Um, and when we think about the children that we see in our CAC and we, we you know, step back and look at child abuse as a whole, um, the younger the child, the more susceptible they are to abuse and the more violent and grave the abuse can be. Um, so releasing these uh, offenders after they've created what are considered to be nonviolent offenses that actually could have resulted in the death of a child, um, it really only grooms them for, for future behavior. Um, I can't tell you what the effect will be on disclosures that we have in our community and across the state as a result of this. Um, currently, disclosures of child sexual assault are only one in 1,000 children. So of 1,000 children that are sexually assaulted, only one of them will step, uh, step forward before they're an adult. Um, and as you all know, working in criminal justice and mental health, um, the, the ramifications of that untreated trauma are, are, are lifelong. Um, so, you know, when I think about what might seemingly be an inconsequential um, offense or even just endangering the welfare of a child, since this is a nonviolent offense and, and um, this potential offender is sent back into the community, um, I think back on, you know, some of the cases that we've had, and in particular, one boy comes to mind who's a five-year-old, um, five-year-old boy coming home from kindergarten, and the bus pulled up to his driveway, and the little boy stood up, and he walked up to the front, and he paused. He didn't want to get off the bus. So the bus driver's talking to him, and he says, you know, what's the matter? Are, you, are you, everything okay? Because the bus drivers are not mandated reporters, so he doesn't really have any obligation to this. Um, but he's, he's a, a wonderful, wonderful human being, and he inquires with this boy. And this boy says, my mom's boyfriend's home. I can see his car is right there, and I, I don't want to see him. I don't want to go in there. So he starts talking a little more, and this, this 
this boy does end up reported, there's a report made to the central registry and this child is sent to our child advocacy center to meet with our team. Um, and our team, as I mentioned before, is, is, is thorough. We have a lot of people that, that come to this child's rescue every time um, a case comes in. You know, we stand up. We have law enforcement, we have medical professionals, we have the district attorney's office, we have CPS, mental health, DV agencies. We all come together to support this child and to tell them, we're gonna make you feel safe. You're gonna be safe. We're gonna make this okay. So this happened a few years ago. Um, you know, what, what we found out was that um, this man was abusing not only the little boy, but also his mom. Um, so there was domestic violence in the home. The boy had injuries and had been thrown against a wall. Um, that, uh, that individual was arrested, taken into custody, held on bail, and convicted. And that little boy, I know, is safe now because that bad guy got put away. But when I think about the nuances of bail reform and it specifically, you know, you can throw a child against a wall and go back home. Um, even if there's involvement with CPS and CPS removes the child, there's other children in the home that may not be removed. There's other kids in the neighborhood that might not even be aware. Um, so the question that weighs heavily on my mind is, what if that little boy had disclosed and went off to school the next day and when he was getting off the bus, that car was in the driveway? So uh, thank you again for taking the time to, um, to hear from myself and from the rest of the individuals in this group. Um, I think that th if I could mention my, my summary is that if we take away the potential to put the bad guys away, what do we tell these little kids? And how will we get them to trust us? Um, so thank you again. Thank you, Kim. That was amazing. I think you touched everybody's heart today. It's uh, some, some stories. So thank you for everything that you do for our children. Mm -hmm. And our final speaker is Rachel Saunders. She's from the Legal Services of the Hudson Valley. Rachel, thank you for your patience, and thanks so much for being here today. Uh, thank you. That's a hard act to follow there. <laughs> uh, my name is Rachel Saunders. I'm the attorney in charge of the Poughkeepsie Office for Legal Services of the Hudson Valley. Um, here in Dutchess County, we have 12 attorneys um, providing support in only civil matters. We, we are precluded um, from our funding from doing any criminal work. Um, as I explained to the Senator's office, when you know, I very much appreciate your support and you know, the Senator comes to every event and, and has been to our office several times, um, I, am, I am precluded from taking a position on, on any legislation. Um, but it has been extremely uh, informative, important for me to hear all of the comments that have been made today. Uh, so thank you for including me. Thank you all for being here very much. Um, you know, to listen to the testimony today, it's obviously difficult <clears throat> to, because you're all on the front lines here. <clears throat> and every single one of you brought important points, but most importantly, you brought some you know, some constructive, uh, you know, uh, um, additions, changes, things that uh, we can take back to our colleagues in the Republican conference. Uh, but, you know, I guess to summarize the best is if you look at what happened with the bail reform law, you know, any person that could consider throwing a child up against the wall as not being a violent offender, okay, that person should, number one, should never have a child in their presence themselves, but they sure as hell should not be allowed to make laws that impact children or anyone else for that matter. So that's the essence of what we're talking about, is that either you've done this with such reckless abandon that you don't care, or you didn't get the proper uh, input and the due diligence to create a law that would actually benefit people, more so than harm people. So we appreciate that you've all had this, uh, taken this time today. We appreciate that this uh, input, I believe, will, will help us in a great deal in going back to Albany and bringing the cases that you bring from the front lines to the lawmakers uh, in Albany. So we appreciate that very much and um, just can't thank you enough today. Anything else? Uh, yeah. um, I'd like to thank you again for your, for your time today and 
your professional expertise in, in all these areas that are touching different parts of our justice system and our community. Um, the due diligence, the homework done beforehand, uh, so evident that it wasn't done in this particular case being brought out today. This is what should have gone on statewide. You know that, though. But it's very valuable, so rather than us lawmakers just rendering opinions, um, it was said a little earlier, their, their opinion based on facts that people are presenting, and you would hope then that your lawmakers are properly representing their constituents and in, in bringing them forward. Um, Sheriff, I read the legislation, I knew it was in it, and I knew it was problematic when I voted no, I mean, as my colleagues did. Uh, it, it is problematic, but I, I think it's incumbent on us to try to continue and stand up to this and, and keep this going statewide to put ultimately enough pressure on so that we're back to protecting our communities. So thanks for your time. This is very valuable. And thanks to Senator Serino and her staff for putting this together. Thank you, Senator Gallivan and Senator Brillo, for uh, t taking on this uh, task and going all across the state, too. It's been very helpful. And thank you to everyone here. I think what I really, like, I was amazed, like, Walt, today you learned a lot of things. I think a lot of people in the room probably did, because we all know our own niche. But then you hear other stories, and everybody, like we said, should have been included in this conversation. And it's our understanding that changes to the new laws are currently being discussed in Albany, which would sound good, but it's behind closed doors, doing the same thing all over again. That's just not right. Um, and it's also expected that the changes may be proposed as part of this year's state budget, another problem. So speaking for myself, I would urge my colleagues to reconsider their approach, hit the pause button on these changes, and start by listening sincerely to the folks we have here today and to their counterparts throughout the state. So thanks again, all of you, for taking your time and for keeping up uh, you know, all the great work that you do and actually talking to maybe your other counterparts throughout the state for, to talk to some of the people that actually uh, voted for this. So thank you.